Today, we'll be making the recipe for a nice plum cake from Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, published in 1861. Ironically, this recipe doesn't include plums, and neither does its cheaper variation in the book. For this recipe, you'll need one pound of flour, a half pound of sugar, a half pint of milk, two ounces of candied peel, I made this myself and one lemon produced just the right amount of candied peel, half pound of currants. These are like smaller, darker raisins, and I was able to find them in my local specialty food store. Quarter pound of butter, softened at room temperature. The recipe calls for ammonia or carbonate of soda. I'm not sure what Mrs. Beaton means with that, but I'm using bicarbonate of soda, known as baking soda. This will help the cake rise. The recipe uses weight measurements rather than volume measurements, so I'll be using my modern kitchen scale to weigh out ingredients. This is my favorite way to measure ingredients, even in modern recipes, as it's more accurate and dirties fewer dishes. One pound equals 16 ounces, so I'm weighing out 16 ounces of flour on my scale. I measure out eight ounces of granulated white sugar into the same bowl. The recipe says, put the flour into a basin with the sugar, currants, and sliced candied peel. Even though the recipe doesn't say so, I'm gently mixing together the flour and sugar because it will be more difficult to fully mix those ingredients together once I add the currants and candied peel. I'm assuming that sliced candied peel means to dice the candied peel. The candied peel is so sticky that it takes a sharp knife to slice through it easily. I'm just trying to cut it into small pieces so that you get a little bite size of the candied peel when you have a slice of cake. Now I'm gently mixing these four ingredients together. I found that the currants had a tendency to clump together, so with my fingers in the dough, I found the clumps of currants and broke them apart. I don't think anyone wants to bite into a big lump of currants. At this point of the recipe, I'm surprised that it doesn't call for salt or any spices like cinnamon or nutmeg. In similar recipes from earlier cookbooks, there was almost always the addition of nutmeg alongside currants, so I'm surprised that this recipe omits it. Next, we need to beat the butter to a cream. This is my favorite step in baking, even if it's sometimes an unexpected workout. Mash the butter around the bowl until it is light in both texture and color. This is where the recipe becomes really unclear. It says to mix all these ingredients together with the milk. Does that mean mix the butter with the dry ingredients and then incorporate the milk? Or mix the butter with the milk and then add to the dry ingredients? My instinct said to mix the butter into the flour. Then I poured in the milk and stirred everything together. You may notice that I didn't pour in all of the milk, and that's because the recipe instructs you to stir the leavening, in this case baking soda, not ammonia, into two tablespoons of milk and add it to the dough. The recipe also says to beat the dough well, but I know that overmixing a cake can make it tough and dense, so I'm trying to mix gently. Maybe this is the kind of cake you're supposed to give to people you don't like. I found in this cookbook and in other mid-19th century cookbooks a lot of references to making sure food wasn't too good, if it was too indulgent, it was unhealthy, or would lead to dyspepsia, which was a general catch-all term for stomach ailments, and especially that you should never, ever, under any circumstances, eat hot leavened bread, as that was sure to give you stomach troubles. But I wonder how many of those stomach troubles were undiagnosed chronic illnesses or gluten intolerances or lactose intolerances instead of just general 
hot, fresh-baked bread is bad for you statements. Foods adulterated with non-edible and toxic additives are also common, unfortunately, at this time. I think about the ammonia that the recipe originally asks for, and knowing that there were bakeries at this time that added ash and ground up sand to their breads to make them heavier so they could sell them for more money. And that probably would have made your stomach feel bad more so than just bread is bad for you. My oven has been preheated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, although the recipe doesn't give any indication of oven temperature. I've poured the mixture into a greased bundt pan because Mrs. Beaton wasn't specific on the pan type or size. The recipe tells us to bake this between one hour and a half to two hours. These timings, however, are way off. I pulled my cake out of the oven after an hour, and that's when I realized I should have lowered the oven temperature to 300 degrees, as the cake had developed a dark crust. Unfortunately, the bundt pan didn't give my plum cake the festive air I had hoped for. I think the ridges of the pan weren't deep enough. This cake looks so much better with the craggly side up. All right, so let's see how this tastes. The texture of the cake is great. The flavor is pretty good too. Um, this definitely needs salt. It's just sweet and not really much else, um, or some spices or something. I think uh, the sweetness that's coming through is from the candied peel. Um, like I'm tasting that little hint of tartness but it just needs salt. I don't understand what the Victorian obsession was with under salting or under seasoning foods. It comes up in cookbooks from time to time talking about how you should avoid really heavily seasoned and flavorful foods because it's not good for you. I've actually never had currants before, so I'm going to try one of the currants on their own. Yeah, it's like a raisin, but so much sweeter. Like, just like a flavor bomb of sweetness. It's actually pretty good. I would I would bake with currants again. I would try this recipe again with like a sweet spicy glaze on top and a pinch of salt in the batter. Um, I would probably bake it at 300 instead of 350 for the whole time. I think baking it at 350 just kind of set up that initial crust a bit and it got a little a little too dark and I just don't think my bundt pan is very good because I barely got any definition, like there was just no point in using that pan, but I wonder if it sped up the cook time. Um, in fact, I wonder if in some places I overbaked it, uh, because it does have some irregularity of color. It's a bit darker along the top. It's still tasty though, like I'll still eat this, uh, maybe with a smear of butter and salt on top, which ironically is something that in Sarah Josepha Hale's book, she says that spreading butter on your cakes is a waste of money um, and like the ultimate frivolity. So I guess I'm a very frivolous person. I feel the flavors approaching that Christmassy flavor theme, but it just doesn't get all the way there because there's no cinnamon, there's no mace, there's no nutmeg, no allspice, no salt. It's just a little bit flat. Like it was so close to being an amazing holiday cake. And I think it's so funny that there's no plums in it. I don't understand why it's called plum cake None of the versions of plum cake in the book included plums. There were like two or three different kinds. No plums in any of the plum cakes. I feel like I'm missing out on some kind of inside joke with that, but overall I can see this being a centerpiece of a Victorian Christmas table. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. Let me know in the comments as well if you plan on baking anything for the holidays and what recipes you'd recommend. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching.